George Frederick Hensel. George Frederick Handel wrote many operas. Sometimes other composers had already written some of the music, but Handel pretended not to notice. Very little is known about Handel's childhood because nobody figured he would grow up to be a famous musician. We do know that the year of his birth was the same as Bach's. It was 1685, in case you have forgotten. And according to one encyclopedia, his father was over 61 years old when he was born. Which, if true, made his father the oldest baby in history. Papa Handel was a barber surgeon, and not only did he dislike musicians, he refused to allow any thought of musical instrument in his house. Fortunately, Handel's mother was a more tolerant sort, and she snuck a clavichord into the attic where her husband couldn't see it. A clavichord is a very quiet instrument so he didn't hear it either. Little George was delighted, and he practiced and practiced and practiced until he was a regular whiz at the keyboard. One day, when George was seven, he went along with his father to the Duke's palace, and while the old man was busy barbering, little George poked around until he came to a room with a shiny new organ in it. Immediately he rushed over to the instrument and started playing louder and louder. Soon the Duke came in to see who was making all that racket. When he realized he was just a tiny child, he was so impressed that he filled George's pocket with money. He also made Papa Hensel promise to give the lad music lessons. So Hensel studied long and hard, and after entering law school to keep his father happy, his father had died five years earlier, but it was a nice gesture. He got a job as organist at the cathedral in his hometown of Halle. His next position took him to Hamburg, where he played second violin in the orchestra at the opera house near the famous Goose Market. After that, he hoped to become chief organist of the city of Lübeck, since Boxtehude was retiring. You remember Boxtehude, of course. He was the fellow who tried to stop Bach from being the first of the three Bs. But he found out that whoever got the post would first have to marry Boxtehude's daughter. Hensel took one look at her and ran right back to the opera house. Boxtehude spent the next three years looking for a replacement. The man he found was named Schieferdecker, and he didn't play the organ too well, but I hear the wedding was very lovely. When Hansel was about 19, he got tired of playing second fiddle all the time and switched to first harpsichord. This was during the run of the opera Cleopatra, by Johann Matheson. Matheson liked to play the harpsichord himself during the final scene, and one night Hensel simply refused to let him take over. Both men could be mighty stubborn if they had a mind to, and they had minds too. Neither one would budge. They scowled at each other, then they started shoving. Then they hauled off and began slucking. The audience immediately started watching the fight, which, after all, was much more interesting than the opera, since nobody could tell for sure how it would come out. Even Cleopatra cheered them on. The two men fought for nearly half an hour, until at last the audience proclaimed it a draw. They had even continued the battle out into the street, where Matheson drew his sword and tried to stab Handel in the goose market. Handel learned something very important from the whole experience. From then on, he stopped playing in other people's operas 
and started composing his own. <laughs> Hensel's first opera was called Almira, and it contained 44 German arias. It also had 15 Italian arias, in case anybody didn't understand German. But it was a hit, and Hensel went on to write about 45 more operas, which is a pretty good total, considering that he also managed to compose nearly 400 other pieces. How did he do it? Well, Hensel figured out a clever little system. When he couldn't think of anything new to compose, he would take something old that he had already written and give it a new title, or else he would use a nice tune that some other composer was finished with. Once he was caught red-handed with a theme by Bononcini, but Hensel didn't care. It was much too good for Bononcini, he said. Sometimes he swiped whole movements at the time, but only when he was in a hurry. Among the composers, whose music Hensel rated were Clary, Cavalli, and Carissimi, plus Curl, Kaiser, and Kuna. Also Lotti, De Grenzi, Astorga, Ground, Habermann, Urio, Erba, and Porta. Oh yes, and Stratella. Hensel might have written more operas still if he hadn't had hard times with so many of his singers. One of the wildest was named Francesca Cusoni. Hensel sent Sandoni, the cembalo player in his orchestra, all the way from England to Italy to offer Cusoni a contract at a fabulous salary. She had a reputation for being stupid, stubborn, and spoiled, but she was supposed to have a glorious voice. Cusoni not only accepted the fee, but married the cembalo player on the way over. According to contemporary rumors, Sandoni later died of exposure to some poison Cusoni happened to feed him. When she arrived at the opera house, Hendel realized that all those stories about her being stupid, stubborn, or spoiled were sheer truth. She was also short, fat, and ugly, if you must know. The opera was called Ottoni, or Ottoni. And at the very first rehearsal, Cusoni announced that she wasn't going to do her big aria unless Hensel let her put in some extra high notes. Hensel wasn't about to let her do any such thing. So they scowled at each other. Then they started shoving. It looked like the Cleopatra business all over again, except that Hensel was stronger now. He seized Cusoni around the waist, hoisted her down a window ledge, and continued the discussion while dangling her in the air two flights up. For some unrecorded reason, Cusoni suddenly decided that maybe Hensel's way wasn't so terrible after all, and he set her down again. I know that you are a witch, Hensel told her, but don't forget that I am the devil himself. Hensel's very next opera, also produced in London, was called Flavio Oloprio, or all over you. Hansel never seemed to run out of odd titles. They run from Admeto to Xenobia. And now that Cusoni was fairly well tamed, the tenor started giving him fits. His name was Gordon, and he kept complaining about the way Hansel was accompanying his main aria. Needless to say, the composer was not about to change, and after one particularly heated argument, the rehearsal ground to a halt. The two men scowled at each other, then they started shoving, please see Cleopatra. If you don't follow me better, Gordon screamed, I'll jump on your harpsichord and smash it to bits. Go right ahead, said Handel, calming down right away. Only please let me know when you will do it, so I can advertise. I'm sure more people will come to see you jump than to hear you sing. It's still another opera. Hensel had two prima donnas on his hands, Guzzoni and Faustina Bordoni. Every time he wrote a nice area for one of them, the other complained bitterly, and neither would go on with the performance until Hensel had divided their parts in such a way that they had precisely the same number of lines to sing. 
Their rivalry was so famous that horses named Cusoni and Faustina were entered in the new market races. At least it was better than what happened a year later, in the middle of a performance of an opera called Astianati. The two prima donnas flew at each other right there on stage, pulling hair, smashing scenery, and bellowing some choice phrases that had escaped the librettist. Perhaps you are wondering what Handel was doing in Britain all this time. Simple. He lived there. He was born in Germany, but he loved royalty, and Germany didn't have stately enough kings and queens to suit him. He tried Italy for a few years, but it wasn't much better there. So, at last, Handel settled in London, and there he was happy. Handel always spoke English with a strong German accent. But so what? King George I didn't speak any English at all. Matter of fact, he never attended cabinet meetings because he couldn't understand what anybody was saying. He became composer of music to the Chapel Royal and then composer to the court. And soon he was writing more royal pieces than you could shake a septide. He wrote a birthday ode for Queen Anne and a wedding anthem for the Prince of Wales and a coronation ode for King George II. It got so that English royalty couldn't do a thing without Hensel setting it to music. Loving music was nothing new for the crown heads of England, of course. Edward III, who kinged around way back in the 1370s, kept a 19-piece band for his royal amusement. It contained fettles, marble, wakes, and siddles. But since musicians could hardly pronounce those instruments, let alone play them, the concerts were very quiet. Edward IV added 13 minstrels to the band. He didn't pay them much, but every night he gave them eight gallons of ale, so they hardly noticed. Henry VIII did even better. His court band has 79 musicians, including crumhorn players, shawmists, and sack butters. Henry was a good composer himself and performed on several different instruments. He especially liked to play around with the virginals. It was Henry's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, who started the whole business of dinner music. She simply couldn't enjoy her supper unless a whole orchestra of fives, kettle drums and trumpets came by to serenade her. Anything to take her mind off that English food. After Elizabeth, James I took over, and since he thought it was a pity to waste all those instrumentalists, he hired a whole batch of composers to write them some new music. He hired Anthony Holborn, who used to be gentleman usher to Elizabeth, and he hired a guy named Guy, and he hired Alfonso Ferrabosco II, who was left over from being music master to the Prince of Wales. Soon all of them were churning out reams of pieces for the king, mostly pieces for brass instruments. That way, whenever James was feeling a little out of sorts, he could just fall back on his royal brass. He was the great-grandson of James I who came to the English throne just when Hensel was getting started in the music for kings and queens business. This was George I, and when he decided to go barging up the Thames one day, he naturally asked Hensel to provide the music. The master of the king's horse took care of all the other arrangements, and on a balmy summer's evening in 1717, precisely at eight o'clock, King George set foot in his gaily decorated barge. Pretty soon, he set the rest of him in there too, along with his guests, the Duchess of Newcastle, the Countess of Godolphin, and the Earl of Orkney, who was a gentleman of the king's bedchamber. The wife of the master of the horse went along too because in her spare time she doubled as the mistress of the king's bedchamber. Meanwhile, over in the next barge, Handel and about 50 musicians squeezed in, set up the music stands and began playing the famous water music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Side by side, the barges drifted peacefully down the stream, the musicians tootling away and the king snuggling up to the master of the horse's wife and wondering why he had invited all those other silly people along. After an hour or so, Hansel ran out of famous water music, but he had to do it all over again because the king was just getting in the mood. Then the tired musicians had to play it through a third time on the way back. At long last they arrived at the dock, and the king told Hansel that it had been delightful, hadn't it, and that they ought to do it more often, oughtn't they? I forget precisely what Hansel replied, but when George barged up the Thames again, Hansel didn't contribute an other drop of music. After the water music, Hansel couldn't wait to get back to writing operas again. For one big production, he imported two singers to London at his own great expense, only to find that the soprano was unbelievably ugly. She was Anna Maria Strada del Po, otherwise known as the Pig. And the mezzo had such a puny voice that he had to rewrite all the accompaniments to take away the loud instruments. The mezzo-soprano was a man, incidentally. That may have been part of the problem. Later, Hendel tried to write a comic opera called Circe, and the only funny thing about it was the lead singer, Caffarelli, who had a habit of goosing the sopranos on stage. Hendel wrote one of his most glorious melodies for him, what we now know as the Largo. But the way Caffarelli sang it, it took more than a hundred years before the tune became popular. It was in 1749 that Hendel got into another royal entanglement. He was 64 years old then and had just finished his 99th cantata. Also, his gout bothered him. All he wanted to do was sit back quietly and read the funny papers. Let somebody else write cantatas for a while. Well, wouldn't you know it? Just when he was fixing up his pillow, in walks a messenger from King George. Now, this wasn't George I anymore, but his son, George II. Anyway, the king had proclaimed a giant victory celebration and was feeling rather pleased with himself. England hadn't won any victories, actually, but George hated to disappoint his subject. He was going to have a few thousand people over to the palace, the messenger said, and fireworks in the evening and things, and would Hendel please dash off some suitable music to shoot off the fireworks by? Well, what could Hensel say? He thought of saying that he had a previous engagement, but decided against it. You can't just go around telling kings of England to pop off by themselves. So, reluctantly, Hensel pried himself off the pillow and tried to think of something that would have the proper bang. <laughs> into the biggest deal of the year. He had a huge tower built to shoot off the fireworks from and a huge stage built to play the music from. He also hired 101 cannons in case the fireworks didn't make enough noise. The date was April 21st and there was such a crush of people trying to get in that London Bridge was tied up for three hours. Finally everything was ready. King George sat down to watch on one side of the park and the Prince of Wales sat down to watch on the other side of the park. And there was Handel, right in the middle, ready to conduct his royal fireworks music. <laughs> Soon the 
the fireworks started, and it was all very beautiful until the man in charge began running toward the gate. It looked terribly funny, but it wasn't. There was a fire right in the middle of the fireworks box. You can imagine the rest. The fireworks exploded, the tower burned, the people panicked, and King George suddenly remembered that he had a previous engagement. So that was the end of the royal fireworks in the royal park. About the only things left intact were Handel and his royal fireworks music. That's not a bad average. <laughs>